you all have listened about mosquitoes and beetles, essential oils, and even insect repellents. Uh, but how does it really work and affect our lives? Today, Dr. Matan and I, we both are going to make the science behind this edible for everybody. Así que toma pulque y come nopal, que el pulque podcast va a comenzar. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Matan. Dr. Matan, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Matan, can you tell me, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of your background? Sure. My name is uh, Professor Matan Shlomi. I'm a entomologist at National Taiwan University, which is where we are right now. Um, born and educated in the U.S., but I moved here about four years ago to work uh, in the department, and I run the insect microbiology depart um, laboratory. Oh, yeah. Entomologist focuses on the studies of all types of insects or a specific type? Now, entomology is all insects and a few other things that don't quite have their own department. Do I think. spiders <laughs> count in? Yeah, I think spider researchers would count as entomology. We okay. let them in. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. Um, you, can you tell us a little bit of your research? Uh, I know that you uh, make research about microbes living in mosquito waters or waters where mosquitoes li leave their larvae. Yeah, so my first project here in Taiwan was uh, funded by Ministry of Science and Technology and the National Health Research Institute to look at the microbes in the water where mosquitoes lay their eggs. So, you yeah. know, mosquitoes like to lay their eggs in cups of water or some kind of standing container of water. Yeah. So we looked at the microbes in the different containers, you know, a bucket or a rain barrel or, you know, a, pot, a flower pot that hasn't been drained and look and see if the microbes affect the mosquitoes. This is in order to what? What is the main purpose? Of well, all research on mosquitoes is to find some way to get rid of them. You know, they are the number one killer of humans yes. still. Uh, you know, they vector malaria, dengue, yellow fever. So any way to eradicate the mosquitoes and solve the mosquito problem, someone's going to investigate it. And we're trying to, you know, we, the scientific community, is trying to attack it from every possible angle. Whatever information we can use to fight mosquitoes, we want it. What do you think about the way Singapore did the research that I that they are type of changing the genome of the mosquitoes for their in all only to produce male mosquitoes because um, the the female mosquito is the only one that bites humans right right so since the female is the only one that bites we can release large amounts of male mosquitoes and no one's going to get bitten from them they don't bite at all. So this technology is the mosquito, the males have been mutated, they carry a gene, so they only have male children. Yeah. And all their male children carry the same gene to make sure they only have male children. So every generation you have fewer and fewer females until you have one where there's no females at all. And that's the last generation. You will have wiped out that species. So it would be uh, manually or let's say consciously eradicating one, one species. Right, we call it uh, autocide. We get the species to kill itself. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know. Autocide. Autocide. Uh -huh. Self elimination. Mm. And this is, I think, amazing technology because, you know, before, if you wanted to get rid of mosquitoes, you spray pesticides that yes. kill everything. They don't discriminate. But now we have, you know, this is a, a sexually transmitted disease, sort of, only it's a, it's a trait, not a disease. So it can't affect any other species, even of other mosquitoes. You know, there is not just one type of mosquito. There's, you know, more than a thousand, maybe yeah. a couple thousand. But this will target one species of mosquito, Aedes aegypti in this case, the dengue and yellow fever vector. Okay. And no other mosquito will be affected because they only they don't interbreed. They only breed with each other. Yeah. So we can eradicate all the Aedes aegypti from a certain area. And they've tried this with little islands all over the world, um, little islands in Florida. Um, other parts of the U.S. and now, you know, Singapore is sort of an island nation. So they're scaling up every year. They yeah. they try this again in a larger uh, geographical area. Singapore is, I think, you know, a whole city state. That's like if we can eradicate all of the uh, Aedes aegypti from there, that's going to be really big news. Do you think that Taiwan is going to go for that technology? Yeah, I think uh, you could do it on Taiwan. It's you know, it's an island, so it's very easy to do a local eradication. Yeah. Just get rid of them everywhere. You don't even need all of Taiwan, only the south. 
Uh, I mean, here in Taipei, we also have a lot of mosquitoes. Right, but here's the thing. It's, um, it's only Aedes aegypti that this works on. Oh, okay. And okay, Aedes okay. aegypti doesn't go north of Chiayi in Taiwan. Uh, where the Tropic of Cancer cuts through Taiwan, yeah. that's the line. And the dengue mosquito can't live north of that. It's too cold. Like right now in Taipei, it's too cold for Aedes aegypti. They well, would that's die. That's good to know. So but, people yeah. in Taipei cannot get dengue. Unless they go down south. Yeah. Mm, be careful, uh, huh? <laughs> yeah. But no, but it's a, it's a thing. Every year there's dengue epidemics in uh, Taiwan down south, Kaohsiung, Pingtung um, counties. But in Taipei, people don't really think about it because the vector doesn't live up here. Oh, okay. I think probably, you know, if, if we can scale this technology up and produce these mosquitoes in large numbers cheaply, then sure, I think Taiwan would definitely be a, a good place to, to do yet more uh, deployment of this technology. Interesting, and this is because um, we want to get rid of all those pesticides that affect the atmosphere, affect our, our living environment, and this is where our next topic comes. Hmm. The effect of the environment that would be the coconut uh, rhinoceros hmm. beetle. Uh, what can you tell us about it? Sure, so that is my current project. Um, it's Ministry of Science and Tech funded to look at the gut microbes of the coconut rhino beetle, Orictes rhinoceros. They live in palm trees. So not just coconut, but also uh, beetle nut. You know, it makes a little red nut that people here chew. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's also a palm tree, uh, date palms, any palm. And this beetle is a pest everywhere from, I think, Oman all the way to Hawaii. So big, wide area where the beetle is found, including Taiwan. And it's a problem for the farmers down south. So what I'm looking at is their gut microbes to see if they have any microbes that help them digest their food. Again, any, anything we can learn that can help us destroy this pest, we're yeah. interested in doing it. We actually found something by accident. Um, so my interest was just, you know, how do the microbes help them break down their food? Accidentally, my lab found a virus inside the rhino beetle. Um, and it's a new virus. The paper came out, I think, earlier this year, a brand new um, picornavirus virus that has only been found in the rhino beetles uh, of Taiwan. Oh, really? Yeah. We don't That's... know what it does. We don't know if it kills the beetle or not. If it does, then we may have found... There already is a rhino beetle virus. People, yeah. we, and it's actually already being used as pest management. You can infect the rhino beetles with these virus and kill them, uh, but too many of them are becoming resistant. And apparently in Taiwan, there's another virus completely unrelated to the first one that infects the beetles here. Maybe we can use this to kill the beetles in other parts of the world. Do this virus can go to humans, get into humans or something like that? No. The no. virus is very specific. Um, yeah. And it works the other way around. You know, the, there are no coronaviruses in insects, in insects, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all insects, there's, no, there's not a single coronavirus that affects them. So this thing that viruses cannot uh, be transmitted, let's say... Insect viruses cannot be transmitted to humans. There's a relationship by eating insects that you don't get any type of disease when you eat uh, insects. Uh, yeah, so very few viruses can live in both an insect and a human because okay. we're, it's such a completely different uh, body. Yeah. The exception would be something like dengue, for example, which has oh, evolved okay. to be spread from insect to human. Um, if you eat a mosquito with dengue, you won't get dengue. Uh, it needs to be injected into the blood. And it also doesn't affect the mosquito, right? It does, actually. The mosquitoes, it does. The mosquitoes don't like getting dengue either. They get sick too. It destroys their, um, their stomach. Yeah. And, you know, it breaks through the stomach and then goes to their mouth when they inject it. But they don't like, you know, it probably gives them a stomach ache if they get stomach aches. Uh, more importantly, it, they, they live shorter lives. So the mosquitoes yeah. will die sooner if they're infected. Not soon enough, they will still bite other people before they succumb to the disease. But yeah, they get sick from dengue too. They don't like it. Okay, so let's. Ho I hope that these two viruses of the rhinoceros beetle don't come to us like dengue. I'm not worried about that. Oh, they're, 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 they're very specific. You know, so insect viruses, they break down. Uh, if, usually the insect will eat the virus and their gut is alkaline. And this will break the virus and then the virus can infest the uh, insect digestive system. Now our guts are very acidic viruses will be destroyed okay so whatever infects our gut has evolved to deal with our gut what infects the insect gut has involved evolved to affect the insect so you know very different habitat for these viruses that's very very interesting and uh as you said uh before this beetle is a pest mm -hmm. so every time that we find this beetle outside of the native area is a little bit like concerning because of the native environment of other places. Uh, I read that it was found in, um, 
in Hawaii mm -hmm. and even in Mexico. Yeah. Whoa. In Mexico, where I'm from. When? Uh, at the beginning of this year. Oh, shit. In Jalisco, where the um, tequila is made. Oh, no. Yeah. This is not good. That's, this is news to me. I thought it, you know, Hawaii was as far east as it went, but if it... Yeah, so this is the thing with these invasive species, is they keep moving. Um, and, and more right now that humans also keep moving from one side to another. And that's another. the main reason why these pests keep traveling. And, you know, we saw it with the coronavirus too, but it happens with insects all the time. Um, Aedes aegypti, this, um, the dengue mosquito, it's... Yes. I want to say native to, oh, I forget if it's America or, sorry, if it's native to um, Africa or Asia, but it's worldwide. Um, Aedes albopictus worldwide. Um, this Oryctes rhinoceros moving, now it's made it to America. And it's not going to stay in Mexico. It's going to infest the entire American continent and then probably move into the Caribbean and eventually hop, I don't know if there's, yeah, it, it, these things keep moving. Uh, yeah. So invasive species are a worldwide problem. And unfortunately, we don't usually detect an invasion until it's too late. So you say this was found in Mexico this year. It probably arrived in Mexico maybe a Way year before. earlier. And only now the population got big enough that people started to notice. So unfortunately, once something has invaded, it's very difficult to get rid of it. You know, kind of like the COVID-19. Better to keep it out. Uh, once it's in, it's not going anywhere. And there are no masks for, for insects. <laughs> not really. There's all sorts of ways to keep, you know, insects out, you know, traps and all that. But um, we, we have no good way to protect the trees from them. Maybe in the future with these pesticides, I mean, you, you would need to bring those pesticides available everywhere in the world. Because let's say right now it was Mexico and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But let's say, what if it goes to Africa where like uh, there are many other species, I know. Right. But what if, if it affects, let's say the cocoa. Um, Cocoa, that, like chocolate. Yeah, the chocolate, our cultural areas. Mm -hmm. That would affect a lot all of those people. This beetle only affects palm trees, so cocoa will be fine. But but you're right. In general, if if something invades, then that you know that it's going to affect a lot of people. It's going to affect the agriculture. So, so we don't need to worry about it in Mexico. What the rhino beetle? Yeah. You got palm With trees, a, don't you? Yeah, but how about the agave for the tequila? It wouldn't. It <laughs> nah, wouldn't I, I don't think all? the rhino beetle will affect agave. But so um, it especially only affects the palm tree. They do eat other trees, but they love palm the best. Okay. But there must be palm trees in, in, uh, in Mexico. You know? And maybe there, there might be a type of evolution of the beetle mm. to, yeah, maybe to eat of another If they another find they species. don't have enough palm, they eat something else. Yeah, who knows? You know, agave has its own pests. So yeah, 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 for sure. I don't think um, agave farmers are worried about something new coming over. They have enough, uh, enough caterpillars and things to deal with. And let's say... Is there any possibility to develop a, let's say, a insect repellent um, from more natural ways? For what? For people? For pests? For I pests, know. for sure. For, I mean, for plants? Um, let's say from essential oils. Ah, okay. So Coming from essential so, oils. So change of topic, moving on to... Uh, yeah, slowly moving. <laughs> sure. Um, so, of course, mosquitoes and dengue are a big problem, and... One of the best ways you can protect, you know, protect yourself is not get bitten in the first place. So wear mosquito repellent or wear long sleeve clothing. And, you yeah. know, you go down south, people in Taiwan, they do wear long sleeves in summer. You know, it's July and August and they're wearing gloves and masks because they really don't want to get dengue. Um, I personally wear mosquito repellent and I always use DEET. It is still the, um, the gold standard. It's the safest and most effective and long lasting. Like that combination. Which it is one? still the best. DEET. DEET. Can you tell us about, more about it? Sure. Uh, DEET, I want to say, was invented in the 1940s or 50s, um, and it's just it's a very powerful insect repellent. It stays on your skin for a long time, so it feels kind of greasy. People don't like it, but it stays and lasts for hours, and it repels everything. It repels mosquitoes, ticks, almost every insect. Even those that don't feed on, on humans and blood, they still don't like the smell. It triggers a pathway in the insects that certain plants make, so a lot of plants don't want to get eaten by insects, and they produce chemicals that insects have evolved to avoid. Okay. Uh, and DEET happens to trigger this pathway in the insects. So they smell it, and they think, oh, this is awful. Not good for us. Yeah. And yeah. even if they've, you know, mosquitoes haven't been feeding on plants for a long time, but they still have this pathway in their brain, whatever, that uh, makes them avoid DEET very, very strongly. Uh, now, people want to know about natural repellents, and I do have um, strong opinions. Uh, first of all, there are several natural repellents that are stronger than DEET. 
Yeah. And much worse for you. Much worse. Much worse. So much worse. People think, you know, natural is safe. No, 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 no. You spray yourself with these natural repellents and, you know, you can get a rash. You can get all sorts of horrible problems. Natural doesn't mean safe. You know, COVID is natural. Dengue is natural. That's something natural. interesting to say. Yeah. So we do know that there are some plant oils that are stronger than DEET, but either they are have stronger side effects or usually the big problem is they don't last long. Okay. They wear off after minutes or maybe at most you get two hours of protection. And this is a big problem with a lot of the botanical repellents is they're, even if they're strong, they don't last long. And so you have to constantly apply more. You're giving yourself a much higher dose of this you know, essential oil, which contains all sorts of compounds you may not want on your skin. DEET is safe. You know, it's been tested extremely thoroughly. It's one of the sub... I think out of all the things people put on their skin, we probably know more about DEET than almost anything else. Yeah. So it's been in incredibly intensively tested, and people use it every day. Millions of people use it. We know it's safe. Like, it is safe. And all this bullshit about DEET being, oh, super toxic and blah, 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 blah. It, it's bullshit. It's all... Towards toxic towards the people. To people. People, yeah. you know, you read online, and usually it's websites that sell, like, natural repellents. And they talk about, oh, DEET is terrible, and it'll poison babies. And no. Uh, they've actually done the tests. And well, I'll tell you, there's only one natural repellent that's supposed to be as good as DEET. And yeah. that's oil of lemon eucalyptus. Lemon eucalyptus. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a type of eucalyptus, lemon eucalyptus. Okay. Um, and they've tested it, and it is more toxic than DEET. Oh. To the point that they say, if your child is under three years old, don't give it to them. DEET is safe for babies, uh, I think, as young as one month or two months. Um, below that, you just don't want to put repellents on them at all because they, they always touch their mouth and their face. Avoid the, giving yeah. the kids that. Yeah, you know, if your baby is one month old, just you know, cover them with a net. Yeah, they're they're yeah. small. Uh, but no, so DEET is very safe, but people... You know, are afraid of it, and you know they don't like the smell, they don't like the feel, and um, you know maybe there is something better out there. So there is a lot of research being done for natural insect repellents. Are any of them going to be better than DEET? I strongly doubt it. Could they maybe exist? Sure. And again, we want to solve the mosquito problem by any means necessary. So any kind of research that can help us eradicate mosquitoes, sure, people are going to fund it. We're going to try to do it, but. Personally, I always wear DEET, but I'm, in my lab, I do now have equipment to generate essential oils, and I do have a little project. I'm uh, funded by the Ministry of Science to try to use insect, uh, try to extract essential oils to repel um, the little biting midge in Chinese, Xiao Hei Wen. You ever gotten little bites on your, your like, ankles, on your legs, and then you don't know what did it? Isn't it the fruit, uh, the fruit mosquito? Uh, it, it's teeny tiny. It's like one millimeter or less. Okay, tiny I think I, I've thing. seen them like biting me actually. Yeah, they're hard <laughs> to see. They're tiny. But yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, another biting pest in Taiwan. They but don't. When, when they bite, it's itchy. Yeah. Oh my god. So they don't spread Very disease, itchy. but they're super itchy, and some people are actually allergic to them. Oh, so really? so I got some funding to to study those. Do I think it's going to be better than DEET? No. Um, but these little guys are actually really nasty and. Uh, some of them are no longer responding to regular mosquito repellent, so we're trying to find anything to do with it. Really, I'm just you know trying to learn more about these plant oils and at least do the research. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, this oil doesn't work. It's another to prove and yeah. see. Okay, here is how long it. Here is the oil. Here's what's inside. Here are the side effects. Here's how long it lasts, and now you can make an informed decision on what's the best repellent to use. Do do these mosquitoes? Are they mosquitoes? What the, the little they, How do you call them? Um, it's a midge. So midge. Okay. actually, they are related. You mentioned chocolate. In the same uh, genus is the fly that pollinates chocolate flowers. Oh, interesting. So different uh, species, but chocolate is... They're related. Uh, yeah, closely related to the flies that pollinate the chocolate flower. Interesting. But do they... Um Can they transfer any sickness no. to... No. No, it's a non-vector. They, they don't transfer for anything. They're just really annoying. Okay, okay, okay. But is this... Um, do this technology is going to arrive to all the world or is it going to be only for Taiwan? Which? Because uh, the repellent for this type of uh, insects. Hmm. Or uh, do these insects only live in Taiwan? Well, it's called uh, Forsipamaya Taiwana. It might actually only live here um, yeah. or you know, around Taiwan. So I think it is a Taiwan endemic organism. I don't know if it's spread to Korea, Philippines, uh, China. I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, it's, I think it's more of a big problem in central Taiwan. Central Taiwan. But, you know, every country, the south. 
Yeah. Uh, so every country, you know, they have, if they have a research um, ministry, then they're going to fund some research specific to them. And like, okay, we have this local problem. Let's use our own uh, scientists to figure something out. May I ask you something like a, is merely like curiosity. Is there anything going to the vector of makeup? Like something from, from insects going to make some type of makeup, something like that? You mean that? cosmetics? Yeah, yeah, cosmetics. Oh, definitely. Um, well, sure. Uh, red, the, I think, it wouldn't surprise me if red lipstick has, um, or at least in some parts of the world, may still have cochineal. We have cochineal? Um, yeah, it's, uh, this actually, oh, from Mexico. Oh. Oh, this is actually, well, you're going to love this. Um, one, of the <laughs> most, one of the most important insect products in the world is a little a bug, like a true bug, yeah. that lives on the um, uh, cactus. The, um, what's nopal. Cactus? Nopal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it eats, if, maybe not that species, but it does eat, the, it looks like nopalis as far as I yeah. know. And it's a little tiny bug, and they naturally are red. They make a red chemical. And so you have these okay. farms where they... Um, they extract. have a lot of nopal. Yeah, but they're not, not for food. Oh, they feed it to this little bug, and then they extract them and grind it up, yeah. and you get red food coloring. Mm. And this red food coloring is very widely used. Uh, um, not so much in Asia, but in America, uh, for sure, this was red food coloring. If you, if you ever see something like you know a strawberry-flavored whatever in the store, and it looks really, really red, yeah, strawberries don't look that red, not yeah, after you've I cooked know. them. So that's probably cochineal, probably extract of this bug. Cochineal. From Mexico, cochineal, C O C H I N E A L, but this was a hugely important source of red dye. You know, before we had all our synthetic dyes, this was the best red you the could find. One. Like the British red coats, they had their red uniforms. That was cochineal. You know, they would. They, that's red they dye. They would from import it from Mexico. They would import it from Mexico. We can't grow it anywhere else. People have tried. Uh, they tried importing the cactus to other parts of the world, um, and then the cactus spread and became a pest. Uh, they've tried raising this in other parts of the world, and no, it's still the, the only place you can really get authentic cochineal is from Mexico. Me, honestly, I love nopal. I love eating I like nopal, it too. like yeah. grilled and all that stuff. You've eaten in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. I love it's, nopal. It's great. great. And here in Taiwan, I'm always looking for it. And apparently, there are some people mm. that have it in Kanting. Ooh, yeah, where it's hot. Some people, I don't know who, but they are planting this type of nopal of uh, cacti in Kanting. And I tried it once, and it doesn't taste at all like the Mexican one. Does it look the same or different? It looks the same, but yeah. I mean, there are many uh, species of cacti that look the same, but they are actually not the same, right? They've had some trouble trying to raise cochineal in other parts of the world. I think, um, I want to say they brought it to Australia. The, in, the, oh, the yeah. bugs died, but the cactus began to spread everywhere. And so now this cactus was a pest and all... Another pest, huh? Yeah, not, well, the cactus became yeah. the pest and they had to like import other animals to eat the cactus and kill it. Um, and then I think in Africa, they tried bringing nopalos and cochineal. Yeah, yeah. And I think the nopalos died and the cochineal began to spread to native cactus and kill them. And now this, you know, cochineal was a pest and they had to find some way to get rid of it. So it's always risky when you import... Uh, animals from one part of and plants. In general, so people stop playing with that, please. <laughs> it's risky. It's always yeah. risky. Um, but but you know, for for Mexico, where they grow the cochineal, it's 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 very good. You know, it, it's valuable. It um, you know people can sell it. We know that it improves. Um, it's usually women who farm it, so it's a very good source of uh, work you know, for you. wealth and mm. improves the literacy. You know, it, it's very good for the communities that grow it. It's, it has a very positive impact. Good to know because. Back home in Temoya, there are many, many nopales. And usually we only uh, grow them to eat them. Mm -hmm. And also because it has a red fruit that turns, might turn green or something like that. And it's also very good to eat. It's called tuna. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very juicy and it's very good. I like it a lot. Well, there's going to be competition between those who grow the cactus to feed people and those who want to oh, grow yeah. the insect. Because you have to choose. You can't do both. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, if the insects are feeding on the cactus, Nepal is going to be all shriveled and gross and covered in bugs. So people have to choose, you know, are we raising this plant for human consumption or are we raising it for these insects that are just, you know, food coloring? Um, you know, that, that's up to the local farmers to decide. But, and, you know, you mentioned um, agave. You know, yeah. there's so much conflict um, regarding insects and agave um, itself. If I can go into it a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Please. So, you know, agave is grown for tequila and mezcal. Yeah. 
There are several insects that live in there as well. Um, the what do you call it? Gusanos. Gusano. Yeah. Mezcal con gusano for sure. Exactly. So for, uh, mezcal con gusano is actually like literally a bottle with a with a. I know. How do you say? It? A little gusano? caterpillar. Yeah, gusano, caterpillar, worm. Ca yeah. A caterpillar, a worm that lives inside of the agave, and they just put it inside of the yep. of the bottle, and people get crazy always that like you end up the bottle is like, who wants to eat the gusano? Who wants to eat the gusano? And it's like, well, for me, it's not something special, right? <laughs> but it's you. You were saying, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would, I would volunteer to eat the gusano. <laughs> I would love that. Um, yeah. But the, but the gusanos can be edible on their own. And you yeah, know, yeah. they're a very important source of protein locally, and you know they taste great. Uh, there's a lot you can do with them. But um, if you harvest the agave for gusanos, you can't really use it for alcohol. You're gonna, you know, it'll be full of caterpillars. You can't really make alcohol out of it after it's been, you know, destroyed by these uh, worms. Yeah. So there's a conflict, uh, and the people who raise agave on the farms for alcohol, they have to hire security to keep the caterpillar collectors out. Because they don't want caterpillar, caterpillar collectors coming in, destroying all the agave, and stealing the gusanos, and leaving just damaged tequila plants. So there is conflict between those who want the insects and those who want the plant for other uses. But it's, I mean, they want the, the insect mainly for the mezcal, right? To put it in, no, or the, to eat it. No, the insect is edible by itself. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in Mexico, we eat a lot of... Uh, a lot of insects. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love uh, grasshoppers. Oh yeah, chapulines. we call them chapulines. Yeah, 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 yeah. They are very, very good, and they are almost everywhere in our gastronomy. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very good. Oh yeah, uh, there's a lot, especially in um, Oaxaca. Oaxaca. Did yeah, I get it? Yeah. Oh, I pronounced it right. Yeah. So that's I think Perfectly. there's a lot of um, edible insect culture in Oaxaca. Just so many different. Uh, uh, insects are in there, and you know there's some f famous entomologists who have gone down to to study edible insects there. Yeah. But it's such a big important part of the the Zapotec cuisine. Uh, I think that's also where they're growing the um, the cochineal insect too. But but again, but there is a conflict between those who want the insects as food and those who want tequila. Your love with insects, I can see it in your eyes when you're telling me. All <laughs> this. Does it has to do something with your love with Pokemon Go? Ah, <laughs> you've researched me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big fan of Pokemon. Um, yeah. It's not a it's an open secret. <laughs> and there are many insects there. I mean many Pokemons are based on the insects. Well let me give you a fun fact. The inventor of Pokemon was an amateur entomologist. Interesting. Yeah. I like telling this story. Yeah, uh, yeah. there I think there is a natural um, correlation between entomology and entomologists and whatever draws us to this field and Pokemon, what Pokemon is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy who invented Pokemon, Japanese man, Satoshi Tajiri, uh, the bug guy when he was little, he liked to go out to nature and collect insects and trade them with his friends. And you know, if you had big beetles, he could fight them with one another. Yeah, in Japan, that's a culture. Right. I, I've researched that in Japan, they like to make insects fight each other. And kids are like, hey, let's go to this park to make our beetles fight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, beetle hunting is still a big thing in Taiwan too. Like they have beetle shops in Taipei where you can buy you know, huge beetles and, you know, beetle accessories, like, uh, you know, cages beetle for them. Accessories. Beetle accessories. There's, you know, companies that make, you know, you know, food for the beetles, little special beetle food and, you know, bedding for the beetles. Whatever you have. Like, Red for, Bull for the beetle in order to fight better. <laughs> whatever you have for, like, I don't know, rabbits or dogs, you know, all this pet stuff. They got it for beetles, too. It's just in the, in the beetle shops. Interesting. But, yeah. So anyway, back to Japan, you know, as Japan modernized, more buildings, more cities, less forest. And so less places for people to go out and collect beetles in nature. And so, you know, he felt a bit sad about this. And he was working for Nintendo. He, you know, worked on the, the game, the link cable between Game Boys. This is old okay. technology. Anyway, I don't connect know. before the internet, you had to physically connect uh, the Nintendos. Oh, in order to Boys. play, like, two players. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, th he imagined um, trading insects, you know, like... You know, like ants crawling across this cable. Yeah, and yeah. this eventually led to the idea of Pokemon, which is you go out to the forest, you collect creatures maybe you fight them but you can certainly trade them with one another it was basically a bug hunting simulator for people who live in the city and couldn't go out and collect insects and now we have pokemon go which is now awesome you live in the city but you still have to go out and do it you can't just yeah. sit in your house so it, it really is just you know the the entomology simulation game it's very interesting and i i like it a lot the idea of, of yeah. pokemon do you play it honestly i don't play it but I started playing it. 
Shit. But there was one moment that I was like, okay, I'm not gay. I'm not getting like a higher level. <laughs> I mean, you could get an articuno with a hundred of uh, of power. I don't know. Right. I don't remember how to say it. And for me, it was like, come on, articuno should have thousands, things like that. <laughs> so something I didn't like about the game, so I left it, honestly. Fair and, enough. Uh, Dr. Matan, to mm. close this um, this podcast with a with a golden with a golden joke can oh, you no. tell us a joke because i know that you are uh you perform comedy mm -hmm. can you tell me a, tell us a little bit of the of that hobby that you uh, have here uh, in taipei uh completely unrelated to anything we've discussed previously but i yeah. will say that there is a growing stand-up comedy scene in taipei um i think we were the only stand-up comedy performing in the world during the COVID pandemic because everything is wide open. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, but yeah, and I've been doing it just for fun. I tried to tell, I used to tell a little bit too many entomology jokes. Now I moved on to other things, but... Uh, Some people don't get him, right? Eh, they were fun, but you don't, okay, want, a, yeah, you don't yeah. want a reputation as the bug guy. I, I, have, okay, I, okay. I have a life outside of insects and Pokemon. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Nonetheless, I think I'll tell you a terrible insect joke that I would never do on stage, but... Still, okay, it's, bring it's, it. It's you can do it on the internet. That. Cl classic internet joke. Um, a grasshopper walks into the bar, and the bartender, yes, for a beer. And the bartender gives him a beer, watches the grasshopper drinking it, and he says, you know, we have a drink named after you. And the grasshopper looks and says, you have a drink named Fred? <laughs> Yeah. It's a good joke. It's such a good, good joke. It's not a good joke at all, but it's a classic. I like it. I like it. I like it. If I need a bad joke that has an insect in it, that's the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> it's good. It's good. I, I, I trust me. I, I do better things on stage. This is just my. Do you have any presentations coming on 2021? Hmm. What do you mean? Uh, like yeah. Do you have uh, any shows coming? Oh sure. This year? Um, there's in lots of shows. Yeah, yeah. Well, in Tai Taipei is open. Everyone is doing shows. We've been doing, you know, all the arts, the theater, uh, music. Everything is like normal in Taiwan. So boy, we are lucky to be here and not literally anywhere else on the planet where everything is shut down. So that's right. By all means, you know, if you're in Taiwan, take advantage of it and uh, enjoy it. And if you are a performer, come to Taiwan and you've got an audience. Perfect. Thank you very much, Doctor, for all your time. And see you next time in next podcast. See you next time. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much for watching this episode. Like the video in case you liked it. And leave a comment below for further improvement of our content. As well, if you like topics such as new technologies, research done in universities, or even wonderful stories of incredible people, subscribe to our channel. This is how you find us in social media. I want to give a special thanks to all my sponsors and team members. Y recuerda, toma pulque y come nopal, que la próxima semana, otro video se va a lanzar.